there she is, the skyward boat, taken on water yet again. But will she soon be left drier than before? Let's see what's been going on this month. We're headed into the lake right now. I'm gonna head back down to the skyward boat today. Since the water level has gone up a bit, there's been so much interest in this icon of Lake Mead drought, we wanted to see how she's doing. Here's another beautiful look at Lava Butte straight ahead. We're going to be taking a quick look at the water level report today like usual, and we're also going to give a quick overview of the Colorado River Compact between western states and how the drought and water shortage tiers affects them. Lots to go over in a short video, so are you ready? Let's get right in. Now over the last few weeks we've had quite a shift in weather here in the Mojave. A sharp cold front moved in just this week and brought plenty of moisture and even mountain snow around our higher elevations like the Spring Mountains. I captured some footage of one of the fronts you can see here. Even have a neat time lapse of the storms I will show at the end of this video so stay tuned if you are interested in seeing that as well. Let's get back to the lake though. And today I want to share an article from azcentral.com covering parts of the Colorado River Compact as we drive up to the boat here. I will put all my sources down in the description, don't forget so you can check them all out for yourself. This article came out at the perfect time as I was planning on covering what had happened with the failed compact deadline that just passed. As a quick recap for those who aren't familiar with the issue, earlier this year the federal government issued a deadline for the Colorado River states to come together and work out a new plan or agreement for use of the Colorado River. That deadline came and went on August 16th, and the states failed to come up with a plan together. As the article reads, the seven states that rely on the river have been unable to voluntarily stop using enough water to keep a rapidly tanking Lake Mead and Lake Powell on life support. The feds stepped back from a threat this summer to force action if states couldn't agree, preferring to rely on voluntary actions instead. Now at least, it looks like they are putting a contingency plan in their back pocket should those efforts fail to produce enough water in 2023 and 2024, which is likely. According to a notice of intent, which lays out the scope of the review in broad terms, the feds could decide to send more water into Lake Powell and less out to Lake Mead, which is their first idea. The Bureau of Reclamation already exercised this power earlier this spring when it moved 500,000 acre feet from upstream reservoirs to Lake Powell and then declined to release 480,000 acre feet of that water from Powell downstream to Lake Mead. This was done to stave off minimum power pool at Lake Powell, the point at which water can no longer flow through hydropower turbines and instead must be forced through much smaller pipes that weren't designed to handle this much water, especially over time. It's critical to avoid this point, especially in the short term, while reclamation studies modifications to the dam, because if any of those pipes were to fail, only a fraction of that water would be able to flow to Mead, and that would be the end of Lake Mead. Now the second idea is to cut those who rely on Lake Mead, because experts say there's only enough water upstream Powell to do maybe two more such releases into Lake Powell, which is why the Bureau of Reclamation also anticipates cutting the amount of water available for use in Arizona, California, and Nevada, which get their water from Lake Mead. At some point, we're going to run out of time and band-aids to keep a critical water supply on life support. Here are the Colorado River Compact states, listed in order by how much water they use. You can see Nevada is at the top with the least usage, being one of the most water conscious users with ever increasing conservation measures. At the bottom, as we all know, the biggest user is California, but more specifically Southern California. I need to point that out specifically, only that region uses the Colorado River water, especially the non-essential farmers in the Imperial Valley. Now most of you already know this, but it is important to keep in mind as we look at how the water shortage affects each state, because it does not affect them equally, or some might even say fairly. As we come to the top of this ridge, you're going to see the skyward boat once again. We're going to take a much closer look, but first, let's take a look at the water shortage tiers from the drought contingency plan agreed upon in 2019. You can see the different tiers here according to the average water elevation at Mead. We are already in a declared tier 2 shortage now. What does this mean? Well each tier comes with its own set of guidance stating how much water each of the lower basin states must cut if that tier is reached. However, as you can see here, at tier 2, 
Arizona and Nevada have both already been required to make cuts, while California is not required to make any cuts until Tier 2B. I know you must be thinking, how does that make sense since they are the biggest Colorado River user and waster? It all has to do with senior water rights. California has more seniority to the river usage than Arizona or Nevada. So Arizona has been forced to now cut around 21% of its usage, while California has been forced to cut zero. Another interesting point the article brings up is the fact that meat is already under the level that it would force a 2B shortage and action from California. So why are we not at Tier 2B? Well, shortage declarations are tied to specific lake levels, as we see. The Bureau of Reclamation decided to fudge that with a concept they call operational neutrality. It stems from an emergency action this spring that was meant to help prop up Lake Powell. The Bureau of Reclamation kept that 480,000 acre feet in Lake Powell that should have flowed downstream to Lake Mead, then promised to pretend that water was in Lake Mead when determining shortage levels. The lake has physically reached the threshold to be in a deeper and more consequential Tier 2B shortage, one that would ratchet up Arizona's cuts to 640,000 acre feet and would actually require California to cut for the first time to the tune of 200,000 acre feet initially, which isn't much. But that's important because everyone that relies on Lake Mead would then be making mandatory cuts, leaving larger guaranteed amounts of water in the lake as it is rapidly tanking. So once again, we see the federal government, who should have been forcing action when the states couldn't agree back in August, instead bulk, cover up the actual usage, delay consequences, and make the situation worse. They are supposed to maintain operational neutrality, but the arguments against that seem to be rapidly gaining momentum. Now they will start a long formal review process, which will take months while well, they withhold more water in Lake Powell so that it doesn't fail. It's interesting that the Hoover Dam, built in the 1930s, seems to be better engineered and constructed than the Glen Canyon Dam, which was built more recently in the 1960s. If there's one thing you can count on the government for, it's getting worse at completing jobs and wasting more of your tax money doing it. So this in itself is a whole other debacle. What do you all think? Should we really be draining one lake due to the failure of another? Should we just take down the Glen Canyon Dam instead of draining and repairing it? Let us know down below. Now interestingly enough, the weekly report from the Bureau of Reclamation did not come out this week. In fact, as of today, the webpage itself is down. So we're going to pull up the last report of October here, and I'll put up the average that I calculated for the first week of November. The water level of Lake Mead was sitting at 1,046.36 feet above sea level, and the seven-day release was at 3,100 cubic feet per second. That's way low. We're going to see that on the graph. Up at Lake Powell, the water level barely changed, and the seven-day release went up a little bit, but not by much. Let's pull up the chart now. We have data from July till November. And here's the content in Powell. You can see it's kind of evened out here. Here's the release in Powell. It was up over the summertime, but now it's come down to a lower level. As we discussed, they're withholding water in Powell again, like they did last spring. Here we have Mead's content, and it has been increasing and holding since the summertime low. But now look at the seven day release from Lake Mead. This is all over the place at this point. And here's the low we were just showing the last of October, 3,100 cubic feet per second, and then bumped way back up to a more normal rate. But keep in mind all these fluctuations you see, this is all man-made. The general plan from the feds in the meantime is to hold back more water in Powell. So as of this update, we are most likely soon to see the water level dropping at Mead again. Of course, we are going to keep you updated on this and any decisions that may come out of the River Compact in the future, so stay tuned. A special shout out also goes to our first Super Thanks users from the last Lake Mead video, Before and After Part 2. They are Steve Elker, Donald Dodson, and Billy Pojo. Thank you so much again, your support goes right back into the channel. 
We hope to see you all at the next update. And as promised, I'll take you out on that storm time lapse. If you enjoy this, make sure to check out our Las Vegas Skycam playlist for more. We'll see you all next time. Take care.